scheduled this week with myself or Alicia. If you're in group A, you're meeting with Alicia. If you're in group B, you're meeting with myself. Um, I've sent, I've got emails from about four or five of the group meetings to set time, so I'm still waiting for the other group meetings to email me to set the time as when you'd like to meet me. Uh, I'm available until 8 p.m. and I'm available until about the same time every night. So from today to the end you must do the following. These items in black must be ready ahead of the meeting. You must have an agenda sent to myself or reach ahead of time. Um, that plans your structure for the meeting for 45 minutes and a chairperson in your group is guiding that meeting and sending it to the time frame. So you must come with a flow sheet of your process and understand what your units are in that system so that uh, we can discuss that. Uh, that's going to be the meeting is going to be for us to talk about your choice of process. Uh, you will convey to myself and Alicia what the process is doing. I, I'm certainly not an expert in all the all the areas that the groups are looking at. So you will have well, time to update me on it. Uh, and then we'll look primarily at your plan of work. Who's, who's doing what? Where are you focusing your attention on this project? Is it on the safety side? Is it on the operability side? On the economic and so forth? Yeah. There is some time that you have to Okay, so this is, this is critical. The meeting is graded and will form part of your overall grade for the SDL project. Any, any concerns or questions on this? Okay, so the so meeting will take place this week. Then if there is an opportunity for a follow-up meeting, we recognize that there's a short term, a short time frame available here. You may not have had all the time you would uh, like to prepare for this meeting. And so the week after, and the, the, the third week after this, so there's opportunity for you to meet with myself or Alicia again. Uh, those meetings are not required. They're entirely up to your group and whether you, you want to, to do that and have any additional questions and answers that have come up. But again, anytime you meet with myself or Alicia, those meetings must follow a pre-planned agenda with a time frame and a clear list of what you want to cover in that meeting. In the same way, we tend to find that you don't walk up to your boss's office and use up an hour of his or her time in the future in a company. You would need to have a pre pre planned ahead of time with what you want to cover in a, in a time frame. So you have one full meeting that is scheduled, another at your own choice in the future. Okay, so that's uh, SDL projects. Then uh, the, <coughs> the second issue I just wanted to cover was to wrap up the hazard and operability study and then look at the midterm. But let me start just by quickly covering the midterm here. Um, just in general, okay. Too hard, too difficult. It's okay. I didn't see all, all of the questions to my mind were straightforward. There wasn't anything I, I thought that was overly, overly difficult. Um, the timing thing was something I just kind of came up with as you saw that in the thing, I was reading a journal publication as part of my other work in research and education where I saw some other universities that are moving to using essentially infinite time exams, so we totally removed the infinite time pressure, and I thought I was, I was just reading it the other day. So I thought, let's give this a go. Um, nominally, for this exam, is two hours. You should find that when you're preparing for your final exam and you're repeating this exam, you must be able to cover it in two hours. Um, the way I do that is I, I, I did this exam in one hour and I did double the so, so to me, that's 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 because of their time frame. So if I was teaching second year course, I usually triple my times. Um, but for a fourth year course, I just simply double my time. That's a fair allocation. I, I really for a final year. So let's take a look at um, uh, this. What I'm going through now will be the solution. I'm not going to post solutions to everything here. Um, so it will be means. What the thing is Anyone need to actually have a copy of the final exam? I have some space.
So if you're on board, it's the price that you would get if you were asking the vendor for a quotation. They would quote you the FOV price. This is the price you would expect to pay to for the piece of equipment at a particular location. That location is usually there their supply source or some neutral shipping point. It's almost never your, your um, location. So it would be simply the price you would pay for the equipment. No installation, nothing. Nothing is included in that. That's simply the base price. And that time, as we learned in this course, is simply the time where if you take your cumulative cash flows for you to cost zero. So when your income and your expenses equal each other, that's the time it's taken for your business to pay. So if you're not taking uh, tax and depreciation type value that into account. Although in a later question, we, we, we asked for payback time with that token of account. But as we learned initially here, yeah, it's simply where your cumulative cash flow costs are zero. Uh, is, is, your, is the time taken for that. And investments, should you go ahead with this investment if you had a DCFRR of 28%? Nope. Um, so it's MARR, minimal acceptable rate of return is 30%. We're clearly not above that minimum. Corporate tax rate in Canada, roughly. So if you had to make a reasonable assumption on the exam question, 30, 35%. Can be as low as 25% depending on which province the company is based on. There's always the federal component and the provincial component. But any number between 25 and 35 uh, is a reasonable estimate. So if you put it is fine. Um, CCA means we covered this in class at the Revenue Canada Revenue Agency's website, CRA. Yeah. Capital cost allowance, and that means simply depreciation. So the government likes to use messy words for something that we simply just call depreciation. But if you're looking for this, and as I've asked you to bring to the exam, to bring the CCA classes with you, capital cost allowance is on that. Does the CRA allow which type of depreciation predominantly? Declining balance. Right, so CRA almost never allows um, straight line method. There's only one class of those multiple classes on the handout that they're allowing single uh, or straight line method. But almost it's always the, um, the declining balance, which is that percentage that's quoted in brackets on the CRA's website. You know, it turns out that most of you go to the classes to do them. That percentage refers to the declining balance uh, percentage. <coughs> so, in a sense, it's described what should be done with those installation costs if you are purchasing this unit. Does it matter, in fact, whether it's a second hand or a first hand unit? No, it's immaterial what hat, where you buy your thing, if you buy it off eBay or if you buy it first hand from a vendor. But the installation costs, what do you do with those? Appreciate them, you roll them up into that into the price you pay for the unit, so you simply take it for six four hundred plus twenty two ninety five thousand. That sum then becomes the book value that you end up depreciating. If you had uh, other major costs <coughs> that you can operate in there, and maybe get to a major maintenance on the unit, uh, after you bought it second hand, you had to overhaul some components, all those costs get rolled up and, and form a single book value, and then the total of that gets depreciated on the declining balance. Uh, question eight was uh, a topic that we covered in class briefly. <coughs> the effect of interest rates should be at least Greater, smaller than 15 percent. Greater, must be greater. We're now compounding on a smaller rate, a smaller duration of week, 52 weeks. So then, um, if you do the calculation quick, you do something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just put the formula, uh, the numbers here, the formula of the class. It would say zero plus. If I took 15% and I divided into 52 smaller periods and I raised that to the power of 52 minus 1, you get an answer of 0.5 percent. 
Right. So the effective interest rate that you then pay when you compound over smaller time frames is is a great amount. Yeah. Uh, I interpret that as you wanted the weekly interest rate. Okay. So we will I will answer, we'll accept both. Yeah. Okay. And whenever there's whenever there's something like that, I always accept both. It's not a problem. Um, the interesting thing here, credit card companies have now moved to That's daily compound. So if you're in some 65 periods, so there your effective interest rate is going great. So depreciation on a piece of equipment costing 34 200 in class 43. So it's sick. <laughs> Class 43, the rate is 30 percent, and then divide two for the first year. So that comes to 5,310. Uh, sorry, 5,130. So we, the next part of the question is looking at the, the same piece of equipment over a longer period of time. So in year one, year two, year three. Both value was 34,200. My um, depreciation written off is in that first year is 5,030. So then the next year my book value will be 29,070. 30% of that gets me 8,721. I get to write off the full 30% in the next year. The book value after that is 20,349. And then the question asks, um, uh, the question asked for the book value at the end of the third year. So at the beginning of the third year, my book value is 20439. I subtract off the depreciation of 30% at 6105. So then the book value at the start of the fourth year, in other words, the end of the third year, same thing. Because the period, the end of the third period is the same as the beginning of the fourth period. So the book value there is 14,000. So the end was always to emphasize that. <laughs> okay, but if you, if you did most of the calculations, you'd get the partial It's not that cool. Um, so times 11, if we're comparing two independent alternatives, do we ensure that NPD is positive, ECFRR exceeds NARR, or both? Both. So we require both for, for independent alternatives. And then the final part is to check um, your understanding of what goes into a bare module factor. Not maintenance. Okay, so I was looking at a few answers. Not maintenance. What goes into the bare module factor is installation costs, labor, painting, piping, you have to pour concrete to lay foundations, structural steel work. Uh, there's a whole list of things that we looked at in Don Lewis's book. Uh, so we that's, what, that's what exactly what the bare module factor is. The bare module factor includes all these things that go into the storage. We can call it installation factor, but it's, it's more than that because there's, there's the contractor's fees, the, the supervision of those contractors, that's all all lumped into there, all that labor. Yeah. Okay, so on the slide of Don Woods that showed that heat exchange had been moved into the bare module, there was a whole list of items. So pretty much any one of these 12 points uh, questions, uh, if you didn't know them off the top of your head, this sort of stuff is the stuff you must do. You have to answer this question literally in 20 minutes all time. Great. This is stuff that must be in the top of your head without referencing your notes, but everything that's there is in your notes um, or covered in class at some point. Okay, so question two was, um, was really just the turnover ratio. We had to look at um, at, this, at estimating the, the capacity of this plant. So remember, the turnover ratio says that we can estimate the cost of a plant based on its capacity. Here we're just doing the reverse. We're giving the cost of the plant and we're back calculating what the capacity is. So it's simply just doing that backwards. You take uh, you have your two 
the cases when the ratio was, was an error between 50 to 150 percent. So you could normally assign with one 50 percent that to 150 percent and then say, well, the expected capacity is somewhere in the middle of those, and we do the back calculation. Um, so any, any reasonable answer there that back calculates capacity based on that cost to build it is, is acceptable. Uh, question three, I won't go through numerically, but I will, uh, this one I will post a numeric solution to later on. Um, but the principle of this question is asking you to compare between three independent investments. Um, so what you find then, we're given the NPV uh, for the first investment. So NPV is the net present value. The net refers to uh, it's over the lifetime of the project. So a few people asked me in the exam as this just right now last year. No, PV is for on a year by year basis. You quote the present value for 2013. The present value is for 2013, whatever year. But the net present value refers to the sum of those present values of the horizon of the project, which is six years in every case. So we've got the net NPV calculation done here for project A. Use these figures here and for C to calculate the same NPV value for the project B and C. Now you have three NPVs, and this comes in to the same principle as we saw in the assignment, where you can choose between multiple projects. As long as they're independent, you can allocate your budget amongst three projects. And in this case, um, the best allocation that leads to the greatest NPV is allocating to project B and C. Um, you, you must also check, however, and this comes back to this discard here, this part. If you're comparing independent alternatives, you must ensure the NPV is positive. Yes, the BCFRR exceeds the MFARR. So that's another important point you need to check or both. So we need to also check the DCFRR exceeds the MARR. Now, I recognize that calculating DCFRR is a bit of a mess, but here you can, you can, it's fairly feasible to say MARR was 13%, DCFRR was 15%. So there we, we meet that criteria. Here, we can, by, if you look at the numbers, it's very simple to see that when you use your time value of money, which was MARR of 13%, that you, you, if, you, if I had gone and changed that to 15%, this NPV I calculated for project B and C is, is, is fairly large and positive. But even if I did go to 15% by eyeballing it, there's no way that DCFR would have been lower than MARR. So you must quote at least, I'm assuming that DCFR exceeds MARR, or calculate it. And I saw a few of you did go and calculate it, but I didn't necessarily expect uh, but that is an important the second check that you must do to answer the question. The question is about the second check. 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 The question is about the first part and the second part are decoupled so that any errors that you made in the first part don't cascade over into the second part. Um, but ideally, your cost that you calculate in the first part would, would normally go on into the second part. Um, just for easier, easier grading, I then gave you a nominal price for the seed exchanger. The price you would have estimated from part one would be order of magnitude similar. I think when I did it was around 800,000. Um, we must take into account the, the fact that you are upgrading this module. Let's just take a look here. Let's go down to this table. Um, so here, Don Woods' table is for um, carbon steel. We're, we're told that the entire plant is made from 316 stainless. So tubes and shells then would need to be upgraded with a multiple factor of three. That means your piping needs to be upgraded. And then that fairly detailed calculation we did in class one day to estimate the total installation costs, the total uh, cost of materials that need to be increased as well. So it's not just a straightforward calculate the area and multiply by the day and the fact that we've done, but there's a bit more to that. Yeah, it's minus one point. Yeah, it's minus one point. So that, that is, and then you must also quote the error rates. Uh, part two then goes on to look at the economic evaluation of that unit and whether it's worthwhile. 
Um, so you've got the cost of the unit. You're going to have some increased sales per year. You've got some eligible costs that you can reduce your income with all by tax purposes. So you've got 5,000 year maintenance costs and 40,000 yeah, your CD costs. Those two combined at 19,000 yeah. reduces your increase of sales for tax purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've given a tax rate, you give a depreciation rate, method, you must use that in time to run, etc. And then you simply keep adding columns. So if I was doing this in the exam, you can either do it in rows or columns, depending on your preference or page uh, spacing. But um, something I did. But um, what I did is I, I laid it out with, uh, actually starting in 2012, so 2012 you'd have your book value, you'd have your depreciation, you'd have your net income, you'd have your tax payment, and then you'd have your present value. You may have a few more lines depending on how you look well. And then the final line you have a cumulative present value. So the very first one you're going to get is a large negative and then another negative, another negative, and then some way you will turn positive. So what we're asking is that let's say for example, and I don't want to remove off the top of my head, that somewhere between 2015 and 2016 you go from negative to positive. And at the present value, they will say minus 53,000 and here is plus 86,000. Uh, you are asked to estimate when you can go um, to give the approximate number of years. So you would then say, well, I'm going to be somewhere in the middle of it. It's going to be closer to the beginning of the year than the end of the year that you turn positive. So that's what we're looking for. That break you made up of that. Obviously, that, that's a minor part of the overall way of getting that exact month of the year. But far more is this angle that you're going to construct. That's where the are going to break So I mean, don't worry about yeah. this minor. I think it's about two, three marks out of the total. Yes. Yes, this one I will come to you. Okay, so question five then. Um, I was looking at a few people's answers and I was a little bit disappointed with this. Um, this is essentially a sensitivity analysis of what is, but it's always a sensitivity analysis. Um, and you're asked for the major points that you would emphasize in a report to your manager. So technically your manager may or may not be interested in this sort of answer and is asking you to give a summary of three major items of interest. What would the major, major point be here from this? The very first, given the, the top the issue that's being considered here, if you're replacing your current steam generation with a new plant that will do both steam and electricity, what is the major outcome that you see from this plant? You will say you will be profitable, but what are the major factors that influence that profitability? Yeah. Yeah, and the profitability is highly sensitive to the uh, electricity savings. That's the most sensitive parameter, is the line that's steepest on the plot. So exactly right. This, if, if that electricity savings value that you used in your base case, which is here at zero percent, that estimate that you've used, whatever the number is that I've saved X dollars per, per kilowatt of electricity, that number has some error in it. You've estimated that if depending on how far your estimate is, that's going to be the most have the most impact on the project's present work. So the base case present work is 1.2 billion, but you can you can quickly bring that down to a pretty low number and make it totally um, not possible for the company to invest in this if that electricity savings number is in error in some way. So the steepest line on that curve where the steepest positive or steepest negative is the most important factor. Another point. So that was the first major one. The analysis only take in one variable change at a time? Okay, so that's the second part of the question actually. Okay. It's the caution. 
is to recognize that you're only considering one variable at the time. <coughs> yeah. the, this, the contrast to the electricity savings is showing that any error you've made in estimating operating and maintenance costs is almost negligible effect on the project present value. So you're not likely to mess up the NPV uh, calculation or the effect of the NPV because at the end, this is the y-axis that we call the interest So the fact that you misestimated the operating and maintenance cost has very little impact on the overall project's um, outcome. Capital costs and MARR, these two are somewhere in between those two. So if I underestimate my capital costs, I'm not going to be more profitable. If I overestimate my capital costs are greater than what I expected, I'm going to get a lower present worth. Does that make sense? MARR is the same idea. If I use a lower time value of money versus a higher time value of money, I'm going to impact um, my project's present worth. So those are, the, any one of those Four lines could be discussed there as, as the answer to number one. And then what's the major caution regarding the sensitivity analysis that you highlight? Well, the key is, as we mentioned, that we're considering only one variable at a time when we do this. And that is not, not appropriate. In many cases, you could have the issue where you have your electricity savings, you were overly optimistic, and let's say your electricity savings were here, but then you also underestimate your capital costs, and you end up paying more for your capital costs, and so you now have the combined effect of those two taking place. So you have the two worst cases happening simultaneously. This sensitivity plot here does not consider that. It only considers one variable changing at a time, but it's, that's never the case. Every one of those variables could be in error simultaneously, and then if you have two of them at the worst case positions, both will have effect compounds. So that's a, that's a key caution with any sensitivity analysis, not just this plot. Any sensitivity analysis usually considers one variable at a time. There are more sophisticated software tools that will do uh, multi-scenario sensitivity analysis for you, and we use statistics, and we spoke a little bit about that in the past. Okay, you can blame group B8 for this question. Um, it, there was a one little piece of information that, didn't, that came across a little bit vaguely, so we'll, we'll accept both answers, and that is, can the company lease it for 12,000 for five years? The, we intended to say 12,000 per year, but um, if, you, if you spread the 12,000 cost for leasing over the five years, that you'll accept that as an answer, because it can be read both ways. Um, most of you though, did ask and, and probably assumed correctly that it's, it's intended to mean 12,000 per year if you spend it on this. Important things regarding this question, there's no specification of taxes, depreciation, or anything like that, but that's exactly what makes the lease versus buy comparison interesting. If we did not take taxes into account depreciation or time value of money, it would almost always be cheaper to lease, and we would never be buying things. But the fact that we get credits for our depreciation and reduce our taxes that way means that, that lease versus buy isn't always a clear-cut decision and it totally depends on the numbers. So when we say you make, make assumptions, the only reasonable assumption you must make is to use taxes and depreciation and time value of money. At whatever level you pick, uh, we'll work with those values. But it's inappropriate to say no tax, no depreciation and no time value of money. That, you know that from this course by now is not, not the way things work. We only start off with that at the beginning of the course to introduce the concept, but it's not appropriate to assume that okay, in a practical situation ever. And so what we'll do is we'll work with the first two years of values that you've uh, listed out here and, and come, to, you come to some conclusion on leasing versus buying, but in practice you, you extend that analysis out to a longer period because over two years it's too short to actually see which one is better than others. Any doubts or questions? Uh, there's no revenues given. So like, did you did you assume just like you have a variable or? Okay, so no revenue given. So what happens with your net income? Assume the revenues are the same. Um, you would, whether you're leasing the equipment or buying the equipment, you're still 
you're buying the same unit, you're going to produce the same <coughs> material and sell the same amount of material. So revenues are immaterial. And revenues are not not required to, and to answer this question. You can put a zero in there, or you can put some fictitious large number. Your analysis is going to come out identical. You will not get a different answer by assuming a fake value. So either approach could work. Can you follow up? Uh, I don't know. I'm just thinking that doesn't have to be. If your revenues are less than your expenses and your appreciation tax yield doesn't matter? What happens then is that if your revenue is, is zero and you've got expenses, then you're going to get a negative tax, which then becomes a tax credit. But at the end, it's still, um, so now you're, when you do your NPV, you say total income minus total expenses minus tax, but it's minus a minus, so you add your tax back. But it's, the NPV calculation will still come out and show the least decision versus the buy decision will still will make the correct decision either way. So it's it's the, you don't all, when you're comparing two alternatives and the revenue component of the two alternatives are not affected, you can just put zeros and you keep working with it. If you, but if you don't like working with negatives, just put a, like a large like a, a million dollars in there for revenue and just work with that. And, uh, it will still come out the same. Way. I put a revenue. I just say that. Have these tax breaks, you would save this much money in taxes. Was a revenue, like, an assumption of revenue required here? No, but um, to then work through those periods of calculating for the first year and then cascading on for the second year, your book value and showing that you need to, you need to work through um, basically a table like this again. You've got the book value, the depreciation, the net income, the tax paid, the present value. And you just do it for the first year and the second year. <laughs> okay, and the final question is uh, one that we covered in class when we were looking at costing of C uh, after the one assignment. We had a, a short discussion in class and, and I had a floor sheet up on the board that showed how companies can set the price of steam in terms of action. So, so this is standard in all my exams. There will always be a short question that covers something that's not necessarily in the original notes but was covered in class. Um, we covered this to show that if you were a, a, a large manufacturer, you could adjust, for example, the valve settings when you blow from high steam to medium to low steam. You can adjust those turbines, whether they're on or off at some, or some intermediate value. Uh, you can choose to export your steam to a neighboring company if you have excess steam and get credits for it that way. Um, or you may choose to operate your heat exchanges that are generating uh, steam from boiler feed water and return that steam back to the header. So there's a, a number of options that a company can use to internally set their price of steam um, that they are effectively paying. <laughs> So that, that question is, uh, it's, it's, it, it basically is the bonus marks that are on the You add up the grades there, it adds up to 105. We'll just grade it out of 100. So that final question is really, is the bonus marks of extension. OK, any so economics then is pretty much covered. There will be some economics in the final exam. But obviously, most of the final exams are going to focus on the operability, hazard, and safety side of things, which is actually the far more creative and um, interesting side of this course. So what I wanted to do with it is, given the few minutes we have available, rather than introduce the next topic, let's just uh, wrap up the last few slides on hazard. Um, the reason why I will not introduce the next topic either is because on Thursday, we have the uh, guest lecture, so I highly recommend you make the Thursday's class. It's on innovation and entrepreneurship with Dr. Uh, Luffy, the School of Engineering Practice. Uh, we started up some of the developed companies and worked with innovative startups himself, so he's a good person to have. So come with any questions on what it takes to start a company in Canada or internationally. Uh, as, it, as most common these days, we don't think we work locally anymore. Um, come with all those questions that might be interesting for you on patterns, on how to protect innovation. We will cover some of those in, in this talk, but there will be time after the question. Uh, you will also talk about the School of Engineering Practice, so if that's something you might want to consider next year as an option. Okay, so let's just uh, go back to the hazard and operability topic. And the slide that we're looking at then is um, 
something that looks like this. Okay. So the prior class, we went through each one of these hazard probability tables. Uh, we looked, in fact, at the, uh, this particular fire heater example, and we looked at two nodes. One was the node up here in Val, just before the split. Uh, we worked at the valve just before, before the split. We also looked at this node over here, just where the fuel and the airline come together. And we looked at, firstly we said we, we select our guide word and then our deviation. Uh, so we were looking at node flow. So as we said, we first define based on the flow sheet what is normal behavior. So we look at node as our guide word and we apply that to a parameter the flow rate, so no flow, and then we looked at the causes, the consequences, and the actions that came out of that. So that was for one, for one node, for one parameter, and for one guide word. So then you move then go to the next guide word. And once you've gone through all the guide words, you then see to apply that to the next parameter, which might be temperature, and apply all the guide words that add that node. Then you may go to uh, the flow rate, and the temperature, you may do pressure, uh, and depending on the units, the, the level, and, and so on. So we can quickly see how that is tedious, and this attitude, as Dr. Marlon has up here, I hate this, this is tedious, um, I just want to do the engineering side of things. Um, so we have, to, we have to keep that attitude in mind, that that's a negative attitude to have. One of the reasons is, as it is absolutely time consuming, it is expensive, and you may find it tedious. But one thing to recognize is at the end, it's a good way to focus all the experts that are helping you with this hazard. So whether you're leading it or whether you're participating in it, it is a systematic tool to use. Um, and a few of you came to me after the class or by email mentioned to me, well, we, I've done this in a co-op, we didn't call it hazard, we called it um, something else. There, there are a number of alternative terms for it and slightly, slight variations on it. But the key is that they all are systematic methods. And the other thing is, it is a, a, a formal document that illustrates that you've looked at the safety issues. So if finally something does happen and there is some liability, you can state, well, it's not that we, we swept this under the rug. We did consider it in the best possible manner. Uh, we used a systematic tool. Hopefully you didn't cover all, cover all your bases thoroughly. So it, it does, it guides you firstly, and it, and it leads to a full document at the end that proves that you've done the work. So what I'll do here is just, um, We'll just take a look at one final hazard in operability study and, and get you to think a bit more about this to end up the topic. Um, and then we'll look at it actually in the SDL project as well. We'll, we'll do, um, so let me just make a note here for the SDL project. We'll do two nodes for your project and the entire group will participate in the hazard for your SDL. We'll do two nodes um, and do three guide words. Um, on, on a part of your flow sheet that's, that's critical. So that's expected in your SEL project. So let's, uh, let's just go through this exercise. And we consider the boiler as our node. So let's, uh, let's actually first just take a look at what we've got. We've got a boiler. And we're using the boiler to create steam. So the standard, the standard method, and, and you'll see, is we've got this level in this, in this tank. And in the down cover parts, we've got the liquid water flowing down there. And the radiation from the flame. So we're mixing air and fuel coming in here and generating a flame. That flame is then used to boil the water, which will bubble up in the riser tubes. So we've got our down cover tubes and we've got our riser tubes. Two phases in the riser, steam and water. That steam will then come back up into this tank and go and be used in the process. Level control in that tank, as you can imagine, is absolutely critical. What is the consequence of running those down covers all risers with no liquid in there?
damage, tremendous damage to those downcomers and risers, those, those tubing. So we must suggest suitable causes of action. And so you would come to this conclusion, we've done it a little bit prematurely, but here combustion without water circulation, we came to that conclusion by looking at the node in the boiler, the parameter, the level, and the guide would less. So what if there's low level or no level? Um, either of those two guide words would lead to this particular scenario being considered here. So if we looked at it a bit more systematically, in the hazard table, so uh, let's look at this systematically. The first, the first thing to do is to consider, uh, well, we've considered our node, our parameter, and our guide word. And then in our formal kind of table, we would have a column called cause. Then consequence. So here we've essentially considered what the consequences and the causes are when we said this level runs runs down. Well, we actually haven't looked at the causes yet. We'll look at that in a minute. But the level runs down. The consequence is extremely severe. We would then document the consequence. And then the part that we're interested in next is the action. And then there will be a few other columns in, 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 in professional hazard studies that look at the likelihood of occurrence. So then the team will make some judgment on the likelihood of that cause, the consequence that would happen then. They would also then look at, there would be an, another column for the person responsible for it. And then there would be an additional column for uh, the date and time by which they need to act on that. Um, and then, then companies may add a few columns that, that are appropriate to their internal ways of working. So we're very interested in on the three columns that are always present. The cause, the consequence, and the action. So causes of that low level. Leaking in the tank. Anything else that we could get water? Too much fuel? No fuel? Too much fuel. Too much, so too much heat being added would, um, would essentially boil down our liquid. But we've got a feedback control loop there to keep our level constant. Uh, malfunctioning level control. Malfunctioning level control. So that's how, so we had malfunctioning level control. Blockage in the pipes, broken pumps. All of those would be causes. And then the consequences are pretty much for all of those, as we discussed there, that we get severe damage, severe equipment damage. So then the action, pretty much for all of those causes, We could be a little bit more sensitive though, for example, for malfunctioning sensors, we could have a very specific action just for that line, where we would say, well, let's add redundant sensors that use an uh, independent principle. So a different me method of measuring them in a redundant manner. So that would be a specific action for the malfunction sensor that we could consider. But for these others, for blockages and broken pumps, leaking, well, let's take a look. We could also be specific for broken pumps where we could suggest to have a second pump in parallel. We'll look at that in the next section of the course when we look at operability. But a, a, a reasonable action to take for broken pumps is 
install a second pump in parallel that will, will kick in when this flow that's measured here after the pumps, so we have two pumps in parallel, combine them together, the flow that's the combined flow, once that's detected as being below level, kick in the alternative pump. So there could be a, a suggestion action there for broken pumps. But that would also cover uh, blockage, if blockage was upstream of the pump, it could also fix that course. So, the, but what we could then also look at is, if we're considering a case where we've got malfunctioning sensors, and or broken pumps, and or blockage, and or leaking, and we are now getting to an extreme case of, of level being reduced, we can then get to alarms and safety interlock systems. So that would be the, the next step. So our first layer is to have basic process control that keeps that level constant in an automatic manner. So as we get natural fluctuations here in our feed water flow, this level controller is going to adjust that valve opening and, and keep it there. So that's common cause regular day-to-day -day variation. If we're assuming that one or more of these events occur that causes level to drop dramatically, we then need to move to alarms. So we'll have a low level alarm. So if we did not have that in the, in the PID diagram originally, an LAH, sorry, an LAL, so low level alarm and we wouldn't have a high level alarm, we're only considering low level here. If we did not have an LAL element here, we would then, that would be the action next to take next. The next safety layer after alarms is the SIS system. And there, SIS always has two components. There's the input, or the inputs, and then there's the actions to take. So the input in this case is low level. So based on a, a redundant, independent low level sensor, we would trigger SIS. If the operators did not already respond to that low level alarm up here, the next severe level of severity is to trigger the safety interlock system. And then the actions are very similar to the one we considered last time. The sequence of events would be to shut fuel valve, open the air valve, open the dampers, if this unit had dampers further up. And, and they usually do um, for additional heat transfer. So shut the fuel, open the air, open the dampers, and then prevent the safety interlock system from being restarted man uh, automatically. So we'll simply just write manually restart SIS. So don't allow automatic uh, changes to any of those valve positions. They must all be manually made. Once the up, once the steam fixed, so this this prevents catastrophic failure in an automatic manner. Then we can come back and manually reset the process afterwards to get it up and running. So that would be a reasonable.